All right, guys, so today we're going to be talking about how to integrate the X-Men into the MCU. But it's not just that. We're not just talking about how I would go about this, but we're also going to be doing some really cool casting. There are some critical points to consider. Now, guys, before we jump into this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Comment down below. This not only enters you into our PS5 giveaway, but it helps my channel. I'm a little channel and I want to do this forever. So help a brother out or something. Firstly, the X-Men or mutant presence in the MCU isn't anything new. There have been numerous reference to mutants or the X-Men within the MCU films and series and the recent introduction to the mutants, Namor and Kamala Khan. Also, there is a line in Age of Ultron said by Cap, we have an enhanced in the field. which leads me to believe that mutants have been a part of this world, although they were classified at this time as enhanced. And maybe there was just a few of them. Now, the X-Men themselves, for me, would have had their first outing during the first Avengers film. Maybe during the whole scuffle and all the battling and all the buildings there now, the people helping other people were some of the X-Men. Now, we're going to talk about Secret Wars in a minute, and that's going to tie into what I'm saying here. As of now, the reason that we haven't been fully aware of mutants could be for two reasons. One, at this time, pre-Secret Wars, the Earth is going through a lot. There's heroes coming and going. Heck, you got Saber up in the sky trying to like manage the extraterrestrials coming in. Like there's a lot happening to Earth right now. Secondly, Professor Xavier, with the help of Marvel Girl and Cerebral, are really good at mind wiping. Additionally, the celestial that's in the middle of the ocean that everybody seems to be ignoring, that could be the reason. It could be treated like the Bermuda Triangle or Phantom Driving. When people go past it or are traveling through it, they, they know they got to the end point, they just don't remember the middle. And that could be because the Cerebral Xavier and Marvel Girl wiping people's minds. That's why we've forgotten about the celestial in the middle of the earth and no one seems to talk about it because this celestial is now Krakoa. Secondly, if you haven't already caught on from the mention of Krakoa, I would be heavily adapting from Jonathan Hickman's run. And the introduction to the X-Men and the X-Men films and series themselves would be set after Secret Wars. It's a place where new storylines could be twisted, added, and some things and people might just disappear or be replaced. For example, Let's rewind back to 1974. We meet Howard Stark and he's got a big task in front of him. He's not exactly sold on Zola's research or his team doing the research for the new so super soldier serum. He flat out just doesn't trust them. Howard decides to take matters in his own hands and forms his own team to take on this huge challenge. But you see, Howard thinks they're missing something and they're missing something on more of a genetic level. He brings in Charles Xavier and Moral McTaggart. These two are the cream of the crop of their field, dealing with genetics and the emergence of mutants. And we know what Howard probably doesn't know is they're both mutants themselves. They're the ones who classify the X gene also in further dividing mutants into two different categories, Homo sapien divinus, which are mutants who have a more elemental and otherworldly power and other mutants collectively referred to as homo sapien superior but that's not it howard also ropes in eric magnus he's a cultural anthropologist who's found evidence that this type of person in power has been tapped into before in ancient times with their collective talents they could probably figure out why the super soldier stone works for some and not most. And also, from a connection in S.H.I.E.L.D., he's given one other person, someone who could bring this research to a full-fledged serum. In steps, William Stryker. Stryker is an ex-Marine, but also a pharmaceutical scientist. Now let's fast forward to 1990. Boom. The team makes a breakthrough. A groundbreaking discovery with the serum. Howard Stark's version of the serum. But here's where things gets a little twisty. Unbeknownst to them, Stryker has been secretly feeding information to Zola, who is now an AI machine. That's right, no surprise here, Stryker is Hydra. This leads to the tragic events where Winter Soldier assassinates Howard Stark and his wife. Now, these four people have worked together for years. Their mutant power is no longer a secret, and Eric senses something strange and urges 
Xavier to use his power to scan and track the suspiciously acting Striker. Now, at this time, Charles has kind of made a promise to himself as well as his friends that he would never read anybody's mind without permission first. So doing this is kind of something he doesn't want to do, but he does. They uncover that their research is being used to enhance the Winter Soldier program. You see, Stryker had become disillusioned with the journey of even developing the serum and disillusioned with Captain America. And also, maybe he's had some experience with a fellow army met mate who he saw go berserk, Wolverine. Whereas Zoloft wants to use this information with Project Hindsight to stop people with a certain moral compass, Stryker, with all the information that he's seen his team gather and what he's learned over the past years, he wants to use insight to kill people with a certain genetic gene. He aims to neutralize what he sees as the mutant threat. Now with, these, with this new information, Eric and Xavier send Moira to the heads of S.H.I.E.L.D. while Eric and Xavier go to investigate even more. Now when they get there, it ends up being a trap. Maybe some of the new facility that we're seeing is kind of retrofitted in some plastics and maybe Stryker has caught on to how to block Xavier from his mind so he couldn't see this trap coming. Whatever the case, the two end up in cryotubes and no one knows what happens. All we know is many years later, she comes and frees them before Zemo accidentally kills them while he's killing the other Winter Soldiers. Thus, the answer to why and how Xavier is still alive now and not passed on. And we also discover Mara's mutant ability, which is resurrection. Together, the team secretly embarks on finding and helping other mutants. What's different is, if you guys don't know, in Jonathan Hickman's run, Mara McTaggart, Xavier, and Magneto use the knowledge from all of Myra's past lives. With this knowledge, they're able to cultivate and become more successful as a people. But after Secret Wars, Moira's powers have kind of been wonky because now certain timelines don't exist. There's different things. This, this is bigger than just dying and coming back. This is on an atom level. Like things have definitely changed. There's no knowing what's going to happen really in the future anymore. That being said, this can also work in the mutants favor or something to touch on later on, where after Secret Wars, not everybody remembers what happens. Like there's no second thought that Miles has always been in the 616 universe to the average person. Like there have always been to Spider-Man, right? Because it's just rewritten that way. But the X-Men, because of Moira, can always remember the past up until that point. They know about everything collectively. And I think that would be something interesting to play with, but back on track. Because of this, we get the divide again between Xavier and Magneto, who doesn't believe in them staying the course. And this causes them to separate. Magneto leaves to go from his own brotherhood, maybe in Majapur. Now, after the events of Winter Soldier, Stryker would then take the bones and whatever was left from the Winter Soldier program to rebrand and come up with a new program, a program we're all aware of, the Weapon X program. And the catalyst that brings all this to the forefront, the catalyst that brings the X-Men to the spotlight, we could borrow again from Civil War. There could be an incident where a kid's getting bullied and accidentally and tragically, he explodes a city block, killing Millie, many, hurting multiples and destroying so many buildings. This pushes mutants and their ability into the limelight. It also sets off a series of events. One of those events is Stryker reappearing, this time using an old friend, J. Jonah Jameson, to promote and start spreading the fear of mutants. He introduces his concept of a mutant rehabilitation center, which is really his private security. In response, some prominent mutants step forward. We're talking Emma Frost, Jean Grey, and Professor X. They reveal the truth about mutants and also about Kokoa, highlighting their peaceful intentions. And understanding that this is a lot to take, they offer to sweeten the pie. Professor Xavier lets them know there's a special flower that grows on their island. And for those countries willing to accept their sovereignty and diplomatic immunity, they offer the drugs that come from them, which is drug one, which cures all mental illness, drug two, which cures all diseases, and drug three, which extends the life of a normal human being. With these peacemaking offers, Stryker and J. Jonah Jameson still spread their hate and continue to fuel the fear towards mutants. So understanding these elements gives us a comprehensive view 
of how the X-Men can be seamlessly integrated into the MCU. Now for the fun part, casting our favorite mutants, specifically the Krakoan lineup. I believe with the Fox movies and the mini cartoons, we're sort of done with the OG lineup per se. Like I think we've done them often bad, sometimes well, but I think to keep redoing the same team is kind of dull. So I've thought to do the Krokoa lineup because it is a mix of OG lineup and then also some new people. So the Krokoa lineup exists of Cyclops, Marvel Girl, AKA Jean Grey, Sunfire, Rogue, Wolverine, Sync, and Polaris. I'm choosing actors between 30 and 40 because this team is gonna set the stage to be what X-Men's gonna grow into and become and why it is a goal and an achievable goal for mutants that are part of Kokoa, who are part of other teams who want to join that main team. It also gives them the ability to pass the torch and that way an actor doesn't feel like they absolutely have to sign these crazy, 30 year contracts with Marvel, like the, 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 the younger team could come in and take over that. And it could just, it could always just be growing. Also, there's a little something that our mutants are hiding from the general public, which will allow for us to kind of recast. What is that little thing they're hiding? Um, mutants have figured out immortality. They can resurrect. That being said, when they re resurrect, who's to say, they don't change a look or two. A new actor can't step into the role of Cyclops. Let's start with our boy Cyclops. Cyclops made his grand entrance into Marvel Comics way back in 1963. The creative mind of Jack Kirby with the help of Stan Lee, he first shows up at X-Men issue one and he's had an incredible journey ever since. His most famous feature, those optic blasts. So imagine just concussive red pulses coming out of your head because that's exactly what Cyclops does. But the catch is he can't control that power. So he needs some special eyewear to do it, to keep those beams in check. Cyclops' backstory is super intense. As a kid, he went through a massive trauma. A plane crash led to the deaths or what he thinks are the deaths of his mother and father. He and his brother safely parachute out of the wreckage. Sadly, Scott is injured. He gets brain damage. And this is kind of the reason we're led to believe is why he doesn't have full control over his mutant ability. And every hero has a home. And for him, it's Charles Xavier's school. He's one of the original X-Men trained and mentored by Professor Xavier. This school is more than a place to learn. It was his home and Xavier was like a father to him. Leadership is in Cyclops' DNA. He's often the one calling the shots for the X-Men. He's known for his strategic mind and unwavering sense of duty. And if you're like me, you've seen the cartoon back in the 90s. Man, when he made that decision to leave Morph behind, I couldn't have been the only person wrecked. Although he's seen as a bit strict, his leadership has always been top notch. Now let's not forget his romance. Like his romantic life is kind of crazy. I mean, like he's been with Gene, he's been with a demon possessed version of Gene, and more than recently, he's been with Emma Frost, which is, for me, if I had to pick a companion for Cyclops, it would be Emma. And realistically, he's been with Emma longer than he's been with Jean Grey, but that's neither here nor there. But especially within the Krakoan era, which is why I think we should, <laughs> this era is gonna be like a lot for mainstream. Maybe not a lot, but it, it, what's going on in mainstream media, I think it's the perfect fit for it. But during the Krakoa era, mutants are immortal, or at least the mutants who decide to go to Krakoa. And that being said, much like vampires, things like sexuality and gender move super fluidly because what is gender and sexuality to somebody who can outlive the earth? That being said, Cyclops is open to everything and including dating his once rival Wolverine. And it was awesome. I thought this was like awesome. I think I'm one of the few people who kind of like, I don't want to say like I understand because this is all fictional, right? But I get the concept of like vampires and and it, just people with immortality being more gender fluid because their time's not limited on this planet. Like they don't need, the, the, the idea of cutting people off at gender is not something that they need to worry, worry about anymore. So I, I always thought that was like awesome. But his relationships have been full of ups and downs. I mean like, 
If you guys want a video on his family tree, and I'm not talking about Cyclops' family tree, I'm talking about the family tree he starts, let me know in the comments and we can get it going. Over the years, Cyclops has evolved a lot. From being a rule-abiding leader to taking a more radical standing on mutants' rights. So although he was raised by Xavier, he is truly Magneto's child, as much as he would hate to admit it. In Hick Hickman's run, Chef's Kiss, because there is a scene where Cyclops tells you he is that guy, like he's about them hands, like he will throw them at any moment, any time when it comes to mutants. And it's specifically when the X-Men have a run in with the Fantastic Four. And this is over the criminal Sabretooth because they have diplomatic immunity, but Sabretooth was committing a crime on American soil. So there's sort of a thing there. And Cyclops lets the Fantastic Four take Sabretooth in. And the key word is let's. And to remind them of this, as Cyclops is leaving, he looks back at Richards and goes, hey, tell your son he has a home. The balls on Cyclops to be talking this sh about another man's family and then walk off smooth like that's a capable leader that's somebody who knows like bro and and he's not just talking shit like uh reed richard's son franklin is a mutant but the fact that he wants to talk that shit lets you know like cyclops is with the shits bro like he's like whatever if you want it because he is a capable leader i mean like I know a lot of people will fight me on this, but canonically, he has taken on, and this is in comic book form. This is not something that we could put, that we will put in this movie because we're trying to build a functioning team with some defunction, but I think this will just be overstepping. But canonically, he has fought and beat every member of the X-Men, with the exception of few. And the, the, the top few is uh, my girl, Storm. I had to give him. Like they was giving each other's hands and she had to give them the ones and twos. Like she was like, listen, but that's neither here nor there. But I'm just saying he is a competent fighter. Now in our version of the universe, if the Fantastic Four aren't here yet, we could do this with some of the new Avengers or the young Avengers, which I don't think they should call them the young Avengers. They should just be called the new Avengers because the worst thing you could do to a young person is just remind them that they're young. But if they're just called the new Avengers, I think that would be rad or like, you know, and they would just be people who happen to make <laughs> mistakes as being Avengers. But if the phrase is to Kamala, who's now an Avenger, you always have a home even deeper, e even deeper. But and this will also lay the seed for X-Men versus Avengers, which is something along with the Dark Phoenix saga that has shaped Cyclops into the person he is today. Like I said before, his family tree is crazy. You have his brother, Alex, who is Havoc. He has another brother named Gabriel. And I think there's a third one. I'm not, cause I'm not too sure. I, I mean, like I did do research. Don't get me wrong if you don't think I did my homework, but I, I guess I just didn't look this last part off. Up, look this last part up. And I am trying to remember if Gabriel is Vulcan or if Vulcan is his own person. But I do know there's, there's, got, there's another brother in there, but his dad, is a space pirate and his crew is called the Space Jammers. They have, he has a bananas family tree, bro. Although sadly, and of course for its time, it was normal as shit, but his mom did pass away in space. And of course, Cyclops is more than just a comic book hero. He's been in movies, TV series, animated series, and of course, video games. If you're a kid like me and you were still playing in arcades, you remember Marvel vs. Capcom and the Optic Blast. And then you came in with the Stars and Stripes combo, or if you had Cyclops and Iron Man, you did the Optic Blast as long with the Proton Cannon. Unlimited combo, unlimited combo. He is the symbol of leadership and sacrifice. And I believe if we're doing a new retcon world, if they haven't solidified his casting as Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield would be a perfect Cyclops. Throughout his career, Andrew Garfield has shown a uniqueness, vulnerability, and an emotional depth in the characters he's played, earning various accolades, including a Tony, BAFTA, Golden Globe nominations, and Academy Award nominations. And, and in fact, he's won Go Golden Globes. His approach to acting, characterized by an empathy and deeply immersive exploration of his characters. His contribution to, to his critical and commercial success. He's got a blend of intensity and vulnerability that's perfect for Cyclops. Now to Jean Grey is 
Also known as Marvel Girl, Jean Grey is a fascinating character. Again, created by the legendary Jack Kirby with some help from Stan Lee, she also makes her first appearance in issue one of X-Men. Now, Jean is not your average psychic superhero. She's actually a powerhouse. Think about telepathy, empath, and telekinesis. She's got it all, but more. When she's under the influence of the Phoenix Force, she becomes practically unstoppable, able to rewrite matter itself. She even has the ability to come back from the dead. Now, during the Krakoan era, Jean Grey goes back to her roots willingly as Marvel Girl. And I think that's gonna be something interesting because in cinematic, we haven't, or in a cinematic universe, we haven't seen her take that title. She's also second in command in a born leader. She takes a crucial role in the Krokoan era. She's actually a city member of the Quiet Council. Now, the Krokoan era and the Krokoan mutants in the Krokoan Island has its own government. It has a couple branches. One of those branches is the Quiet Council. Her leadership shines through in comic book form when they're on an impossible mission to prevent a satellite from turning into a Sentinel factory. Jean is an Omega level mutant, which means she's incredibly powerful. Her telepathy and telekinesis is some of the strongest seen in Marvel comic universe. She's taking on heavyweights like Galactus when she's at full power. Now in her relationships, like I said with Scott, it's open. Everybody is free to explore with everybody. She shares a close relationship with Storm and now her and Wolverine are best friends. There's not like this third will strain between their relationship anymore. Over the years, Jean Grey has evolved from that girl who happens maybe possibly be a sideline X-Men to a more critical role in all of Marvel comic book history or comic book universe, playing pivotal roles in major story arcs. It is with those reasons and more, I think Kate Bosworth would be an excellent casting for Jean Grey. If you're not familiar with Kate, let me tell you, she's got acting chops. She has the on-screen presence that can make Jean Grey step out. With Jean's complexity, powerful yet profoundly human, and Kate's proven ability to portray characters with a multi-layered personality would work wonders with Jean. Plus there's no design, Kate has the ability to command attention in a way that's subtle yet powerful. A trait that's essential when playing a character like Jean Grey. Kate's performances have always had a wonderful balance of strength and sensitivity, qualities that are at the core of Jean Grey's character. Jean is not just a mutant with incredible powers, she's a character with deep emotional layers struggling with immense responsibility. Kate's experience with roles require a strong emotional range makes her an ideal candidate to tackle the complexities of Jean Grey. A character who's both a formidable Omega level mutant and a compassionate, empathetic team member. The empathy and intensity that Kate can bring to the role would definitely make her portrayal of Jean Grey memorable and impactful in the Marvel Universe. All right, guys, so those are my picks and why I would choose them in this video. Be on the lookout for part two of this. Thanks for stopping by, guys. Stay excellent, and I'll catch you guys later.